Turn with me to Luke, 15, Luke 14. Luke 14. When, uh, when I was at camp uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was not the only preacher who was there. Uh, Mike Claus from First Christian and Elizabethan and, uh, and his youth minister uh, were there, and uh, so was Ron Marvel from East Tennessee Christian Home and Academy. Uh, each morning, uh, Ron and, uh, and his son Bailey uh, put on a skit right after breakfast. So they did this skit that, did, that had something to do with the lesson for the day, you know, the, the theme for, for the day. They did a really good job with, with their skits. On Thursday morning, uh, they got some more of the counselors involved, and they did that skit at the pool. So we all went out to the pool, and, and, uh, and they did that. And one of, the, one of the counselors was dressed in a robe like Jesus. And then the other counselors came up to Jesus and were talking to Jesus about uh, giving their lives to him, committing themselves to, to him. And, and e- each one of them, one by one, made excuses for why they weren't going to give their, their life to Jesus. Uh, one of them said, you know, I, I want to do that. And then she bent over and, and stuck her hand in the pool and just kind of swished the water around some and said, yeah, that's enough, and then walked off. So she was ready to commit, but just not fully, right? Just, yeah, that was enough. And, uh, and then the last counselor came up and said that he was, if he was going to do that, if he was going to follow Jesus, he wanted to do it wholeheartedly with everything that he had. And then to demonstrate that, he jumped into the pool. Which is a good picture, right? Total commitment, all in. Because once you're in the air, there's no going back. You've committed. There's only only water water after that. So it's a vivid illustration of what it it means to follow Jesus. We can't follow Jesus partially. Some of the time. You know, we can't commit part of our lives to to being his disciples. We, We have to be fully committed and jump in and give all of our lives to Jesus. In Luke 14, we're finishing up this chapter. Uh, Jesus is going to talk about our commitment to him. Now, just kind of refresh our memories because it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, Jesus is slowly making his way to Jerusalem. He's not in a hurry. Usually the trip took about a week, and and he's taking even longer because he's stopping along the way and, and spending a few days uh, ministering and preaching and healing, healing the sick. And so chapter 14 begins with Jesus visiting a, in the home of a prominent Pharisee on the Sabbath. Although he wouldn't have been traveling on the Sabbath because that, that would have been work. And so he couldn't walk very far. But So he spent the day at the home of this religious leader. And, and we read that as soon as Jesus entered the Pharisee's home, he, he noticed a man suffering from uh, this abdominal swe- uh, abnormal swelling of his body. And Jesus asked the Pharisees, the teachers of the law who are present there, if, if it was right for him to heal this man on the Sabbath. And, and they, they were afraid to give an answer. They didn't say anything. And when, so when they refused to give an answer, Jesus healed the man. And, and you can be sure that didn't make them happy. They, they didn't like Jesus healing on the, the Sabbath. But what Jesus said after that made him even even less happier. Uh, Jesus looked at those who were there and he he noticed how each of them were were trying to vie for the best seat because the the, the better the seat, the the more honor that was was, uh, associated with it. And so they wanted the seats closest to the host. And Jesus suggested that instead of trying to get the best seat, they shouldn't worry about it. They should just take the least important seat and then allow the host to give them a better seat. So then they would be honored in that way instead of being humiliated if they, they sat in a seat too, too prominent and, and the host moved them back. And then turning to the host, Jesus said that, that he should invite those to, who can't repay him. Because all those who were there that day would feel obligated to invite him over to their house. Well, John had me over to his house, so I guess next month I... I Got to have him at my house. Right? Next time I have a banquet, I, I got to invite him because he invited me. And so throughout the year, he would be repaid by these, each of these guests he had, he had invited. He said, instead, you should invite the poor, the, 
the crippled, the lame, the blind. Invite them to a meal. They can't pay you back, but God, Jesus says, would reward him. Now, it would seem that the guests were getting kind of squirmish because one of the guests tried to change the subject and started talking about a reward that we would receive from God, a banquet when the Messiah came. And so Jesus told the parable about the, the man who invited some guests to a banquet. And, and the guests all accepted the, the invitation. But then when the day came for the banquet, they, they one by one, they started making excuses for why they, they couldn't come. So the host invited instructed the servants to invite any, just anyone you can. Go out in the streets, the alleys, wherever you can find someone and, and invite them in. And Jesus was making the point that, that just as that host could be turned down, his invitation could be turned down, uh, there would be some who would turn down the invitation of God. And they wouldn't make that final banquet when the Messiah came because they had already turned down the invitation. And Jesus was speaking to them. You know, they understood. Jesus was saying, you know, the Jews are going to refuse it, and so others will be invited. And by those others, he meant Gentiles. He meant the rest of the world. And again, you can be sure that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't like what Jesus had to tell them. All right, so now we come to verse 25 of Luke 14. The religious leaders may have been rejecting Jesus, but the people... The people were flocking to hear Jesus. Uh, they wanted, they were latching on to everything uh, that he had to say. They were giving him a warm reception. All right? 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. So the, the closer Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the larger the crowds get. Again, they're, they're, they're making their way to Jerusalem because they're traveling there uh, for the Passover. Now, this isn't the first time that Luke talks about these large crowds following uh, Jesus or coming to hear him teach. In Luke chapter 12, we saw where Luke says that there were thousands, many thousands who had gathered to hear Jesus. In fact, it, Luke says there were so many, they were knocking into each other and stepping on each other. You know, the crowd was getting, getting so large, so, so thick. And so reports of, of these people clamoring to hear Jesus you know, you would think that would be a good thing, right? Jesus' message is getting out. The, the people are receiving it, and they're coming to hear Jesus. That, that, that's a great thing. But notice how Jesus responds to these, to these large crowds. Again, from verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, if we were to have a large crowd, we would, we would say, thank you for coming out today. It's great to see you. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, why are you here? Do you understand what you're doing? I don't think you do. Jesus doesn't seem to make it easy to follow him. He, he seems to make it harder. Jesus tells those, if, if you want to follow me, you have to hate the members of your family. You want to be my disciple, you have to hate your family members. And, and those words aren't any easier to hear now than they were then. But is Jesus really telling us to hate, to hate our families? And I think we can safely say no. Jesus isn't saying to hate. And we can say no because to say yes would be to go against everything Jesus had taught. Jesus didn't teach us to hate. Jesus, Jesus taught us to love. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus commended the expert in the law for saying that we need to love God and our neighbors. He asked, well, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what do you see in the law? And the man replied, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered well. Now, later, 
Jesus is, is going to be asked, what are the two most important commands? And Jesus is going to answer, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It sums up the law of God. And so if we do those things, if we love God, we love our neighbors, we're, we're keeping the rest of, of God's laws. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said in, in Matthew 5, verses 43 and through 45, he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It's, it sounds like God loves enemies, his enemies. God loves those who don't love him. And we're to follow the example of God. Well, if we follow the example of God, we're, we're to love our enemies, those who don't like us. And if Jesus wants us to love our enemies, surely he also wants us to love our families, right? That makes sense. And so we can be sure Jesus is not telling us to, to hate our parents, our spouse, our children, our siblings, or even ourselves. So what is Jesus telling us? Well, Jesus is using this extreme language to get our attention. Again, previously, Jesus had told that parable about the man who invited some people to his banquet, and then when the banquet came, they all made excuses. The first one said, well, I, I bought some land, and I need to go look at my land, so I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make your, your banquet. Thank you, though, but I'm not attending. The next man said, well, I, I purchased some oxen, and I need, to, I need to go out and try the oxen, so I, I'm not going to be able to be there. And then the the third man said, well, I just got married and, you know, I hate to leave my wife here so because uh, the women weren't invited. So uh, I, I can't come because I'm going to stay home with, with my wife. In other words, their devotion to their property, their, their farm animals, uh, their, their family was more important than the commitment they had made to going and eating at this banquet. The man had made preparations according to how many had said they were coming, and now they weren't coming. And Jesus is saying that our love for him has to be greater than any other commitment we have. Because if a choice has to be made between our commitment to Jesus or our commitment to our families, our commitment to Jesus has to come first. Now, there are cultures where, you know, you make a commitment to become a Christian and they, your family just cuts you off. So that commitment, that's real obvious. Uh, we don't have that. So, so it's less obvious. But our commitment to Jesus must come first. Period. And if we, we don't love Jesus more than anyone or anything then, then we need to hear this message. Our, our love for him must be the greatest love in our life. And Jesus isn't diminishing the love and devotion we're ha we have for our families. He's just saying our love for him, our commitment to him has to be greater. And I, I think Jesus uses the illustration of family because generally family is the strongest commitments we have. The commitments we make to our families. They make the greatest demands and at times can be the biggest block to our devotion to God. In fact, we, we must love Jesus more than them. We must love Jesus even more than we love ourselves. We must want what Jesus desires for us more than we want what we desire for us. We have to put him first, commit our lives to him. And additionally, Jesus says we have to be willing to bear a cross in order to follow him. Now, we're not carrying Jesus' cross. We, we understand what, what that meant for Jesus. That's, that's not the cross we're bearing. But, but we have to, to bear our own cross. And some mistakenly confuse their cross with, with some unpleasant situation in their lives. And if your mother-in-law moves in with you, that is not your cross. 
Now, crosses are not some, some unpleasantry that we might have. But a cross does involve suffering. You know, why did Jesus go to the cross? Why was he crucified? Well, it's not because of something he did wrong. He suffered for us. So I, I think a better understanding of the cross we, we are called to bear is that, that we suffer for others. Jesus died for us. Well, few people are, are called to die for others. But we'll regularly have opportunities to suffer for others. To suffer because of our love for them. Because of the grace, mercy, or forgiveness we show them. Instead of looking out for others, or for ourselves, we're to look out for others. Now, continuing in, in our passage, Jesus gives a couple of illustrations about uh, starting a project and not being able to finish. Verse 28, he says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone will, who, will, who, see it, who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build but wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the late 1800s, John Stuart McKegg, a wealthy Scottish banker, designed a tower to be built, a lasting monument to his family. He also figured that the work, it would give work to the stonemasons uh, w when they were off work, you know, during the off season, he would be able to employ them. And so they would, would have a job in the off season. Now, the design included the outer wall, which was designed after uh, the Colosseum in Rome. Inside the tower, he planned to build a museum and an art gallery with a central tower. He was going to commission statues of himself and his parents and siblings but he died in 1902, just after the outer wall had been completed and nothing else started. So that's all that there is today, just that outer wall. And the outer wall is pretty impressive, but it's not complete. There's a lot left undone. Now today, inside the walls, there's a public garden. Uh, the first wedding ceremony conducted there was between two high school teachers. I thought this was interesting. The names were interesting. It's the only reason I share this one. The names of the teachers were Jim Maxwell and Margaret Milligan in July of 2003. And now local, local residents still refer to it as uh, McKaig's Tower, but tourists known it, know it, uh, call it uh, McKaig's Folly <laughs> because they see that it was started <laughs> and it was never finished. Now, he had a good excuse. He didn't run out of money. He had a heart attack. Kind of hard to finish. Yet we all know it's easier to start a project than to finish it. Right? We start it with enthusiasm, but somehow, you know, I, I just have too many unfinished projects at home that, that testify to that. You know, and depending on the project, how, how embarrassing that can be. Uh, this, this last spring, I started putting some edging around uh, the flower garden out in the out in the front of the house, and you now I got it about half finished. I haven't finished yet. In fact, I haven't worked on it in, yeah, in almost two months. I probably ought to do that this fall when it gets cooler. <laughs> you can't see it from the street, though, so, no, you know, probably, if you're just driving by, you don't know that I've done any work, you know, only if you walk up close. So that, that's not too embarrassing. But the more, you know, the more public it is, uh, the more the more humiliation that would go with it as people, more people see it. And so Jesus talks about this guy like McKeg who, who started this tower. Uh, the tower was probably in his vineyard. Uh, they would build towers in the vineyard so that they could get a good view 
of those who are trying to come steal from them. They steal their harvest. So this guy starts the tower, and then he runs out of money. A tower, everybody's going to see that, right? It's, it's going up. You can see it for a while off, and they're going to see that he didn't get to complete it. It's just going to be a, a public humiliation. The second illustration Jesus, uh, Jesus gave was, was that of, of a king going to war. Right? You want to make sure you have a good chance of winning. Because if you don't think you can win, then don't fight. Because if you lose, it's not just a public humiliation. Uh, losing a battle is going to cost lives. It's going to be a lot more important than, than just some humiliation. And so it's important to know that we are able to finish what we've started and so these crowds are following Jesus, and, and they're all making their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. And Jesus wants to know, do, do you understand the cost of the commitment that you say that you're making to follow me, to be my disciple? You know, there are some who paint the Christian life as one of, of beautiful bliss uh, with no more problems. Become a Christian and and God's going to take every problem from your life. Anybody experience that, though? You know, as the saying goes, Jesus didn't promise us a rose garden. Right? In fact, Jesus said the opposite. But Jesus said in this world we will have trouble. Jesus says that because we love him, the world will hate us. But Jesus also promises that he's always with us. And that his burdens... Our light. And so Jesus says we need to understand the commitment that we are making when we decide to follow Jesus. So that we don't start something and then turn back. The demands of Jesus are high. But again, Jesus is with us. He will be with us every step of the way. Verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Now, are we willing to give our all to follow Jesus? We're willing to follow and obey when it's easy, but how about when it's not easy? How about when there comes a conflict between what Jesus is asking us to do and what family is calling us to do. How about when it requires carrying a cross? Jesus says we cannot be his disciple if we're not willing to give him our all. Verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile it is thrown out. Now, there are a lot of uses for salt. William Barclay pointed out three in his commentary. He says, uh, salt was used as a preservative. It is the earliest of all preservatives. The Greeks used to say that salt could put new soul into dead things. Well, not literally, but you got the idea. Without salt, a, a thing uh, putrefied and went bad. With it, its freshness was preserved. All right, so salt was used for a preservative. Second, salt was used as a flavoring. Barclay says, food without salt can be revoltingly insipid. You've been in the hospital and they won't let you have salt, you know. <laughs> it needs some salt. Third, he said, and I didn't know this one, salt was used on the land. It was used to make it easier for all good things to grow. I never heard that one before. All right, so, so, and there's many more uses for salt. But with those in, in mind, which, which one did Jesus intend? I, I think he meant all of those and, and more. You know, as a preservative, Barclay says, true Christianity must act as a preservative against the corruption of the world. The individual Christian must be the conscience of his fellows. And the church, the conscience of the nation, the Christian must act 
must be such that in his presence no doubtful language will be used, no questionable stories told, no dishonorable action suggested. He must be like a cleansing antiseptic in the circle in which he moves. And the church must fearlessly speak against all evils and support all good causes. She must never hold her peace through, through fear or favor of men. We're also to be a flavoring agent. Again, Barclay says the Christian must be the one who brings flavor into life. The, Christi the Christianity which acts like a shadow of gloom or a, or a wet blanket is no true Christianity. The Christian is the one who by courage, hope, cheerfulness, and kindness brings a new flavor into life. You've seen those kind of people, haven't you? Just bring joy wherever they go. And then third, he says, as for helping good things grow, the Christian must be such that he makes it easier for people to do good and harder to do bad. He says, we all know people in whose company, if we're with them, there are certain things we would just never do, could not do. But we also know people in whose company uh, we might well stoop to things that we wouldn't do otherwise. There are fine souls in whose company it is easier to be brave and cheerful, and there are others which just make it easier to sin. The Christian must carry a breath of heaven in which the fine things flourish and the evil things shrivel up. I think Jesus meant all of those and more. But more importantly, I think what Jesus is saying here is that if salt loses its saltiness, what is it good for? What do you do with it? He says you just throw it out. In other words, if something loses its essential quality, it, if it fails to perform its essential duty, you throw it out. If we fail to do that which God has called us to do, what good are we? And then Jesus ends with these words of warning. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now we've discussed this, this before as we're going through Luke. You know, it's, we know it's possible to have ears without hearing or without listening. You know, it comes in one ear and, and goes out the other. And, and we need to remember too that in Jewish tradition, to hear also implied that you obeyed. If you heard it, then you did it, what was told. That's how you showed that you heard it. You know, we talk about our children. Uh, did you hear what I said? Well, why did you say, why did you ask? Well, because they didn't do what you just said. If they had heard, they would have cleaned their rooms. But their rooms aren't clean, so they must not have heard you. Did you hear what I said? And so we are to hear, we are to put into practice the teachings that Jesus gives us. Two professors were talking about a student at the university, and the first professor said, I've heard that Tom was one of your students. And the second responded, well, he may have intended my lectures, but he wasn't a student. <laughs> now, why did he say that? Because <laughs> he didn't do anything. He, he didn't practice what he had been taught. So it's possible to listen without actually hearing. It's possible to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple of Jesus. Or as Kyle Eidelman put, it's possible to be a fan of Jesus without being committed to Jesus. One commentator put it this way, says, it is, of the supreme, it is one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in it there are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples. So many followers, so few disciples. If you're reading the uh, two-year Bible reading plan with us, uh, uh, we are now in the book of Judges, and I thought last Wednesday's reading was kind of difficult. Read chapters two and three. And it was difficult not because it was hard to understand. Oh, it was easy to understand what it was saying. That was the problem. It, it was so easy to understand. What it made difficult was to, to see how foolish the Israelites were. God delivered them 
from slavery in Egypt, parted the Red Sea, gave them his commands at Mount Sinai, provided for them as they wandered through the wilderness, stopped the flow of the Jordan River so they could cross on dry land, chased out their enemies when they took possession of the promised land, and then what'd they do? They turned their backs on God. They quickly stopped following God. Now, it's not like they just stopped believing in God. The priests were still offering sacrifices to God at the tabernacle. It's just that in addition to worshiping God, they also decided to worship the idols of the nations around them. And as a result, God said he would allow them to be defeated by their enemies. God said in Judges 2, verses 21 and 22, says, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. He's going to stop giving them victories over their enemies. He says, I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. He's going to use these enemies to see if, how committed they are to him. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Judges, you're familiar with the, the cycle that keeps repeated the whole way through. They follow God. They stop following God. God allows them to be defeated by their enemies. They cry out to God. God sends a judge who delivers them. They follow God until that judge dies, and then it gets repeated again, and you see that repeated numerous times throughout the book of Judges. That's what's difficult to read. Because you read it and you say, why are you doing this? Why didn't you learn? You thought you'd have learned. When you cried out to God the last time for help, you thought you would have learned. But they didn't. Because they thought they could partially serve God and still serve him and still please him. We're going to serve God and we're going to serve worship these idols and God called them to be fully committed to him and they refused and as a result he allowed the enemies around them to stick around just to be a test to see how they would respond and how did the Israelites do in that test it, they failed miserably <laughs> time and time again and as I read that I wonder how does God test us today how does God test our commitment to him today? If, if God tested their commitment, don't you think he's still testing ours? I, I think it's different. The tests are different, but I think he's still doing it. Testing, if, if we love him more than we love our own lives, our families, so Jesus uses the illustration of the family and said we're to love him more than, than anything else. Do we love him more than our relationships, more than our possessions, more than, than even our love for ourselves? Are we fully committed to Jesus, to being his disciples? Or do we let other things kind of creep in and steal some of our devotion? Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would show us where we are not fully committed. We want to be your disciples, to, to follow you, to not turn back. And so we ask that you would help us to see, to see where we need to, to return to you, see those areas in our lives that we need to commit more to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.